So last time we introduced the notion of a quadratic residue, and so specifically we have that an integer a is a quadratic residue modulo p if the congruence class of a in the integers modulo p is a perfect square. So that is, there exists some integer b such that b bar squared is equal to a bar in the integers modulo p. And so quadratic residue is just a fancy word for saying perfect squares when we're, when we're talking about the integers mod p. And so the study of these began with Euler who in 1747 proved what is known as the descent lemma and essentially was halfway to proving the Fermat sums of two squares theorem. But he got stuck in a certain portion that would take him two years to fill in. And this is where uh, we, what we are going to be using now. And so the idea stems to the following. If we have that something is a, so we know by using Lagrange's theorem that in the integers modulo p, there are p minus 1 over 2 quadratic residues. So we show this using Lagrange's theorem. And so what Euler was interested in was, sure, we have p minus 1 over 2, but if you're given some arbitrary element in the integers modulo p, how can you determine whether it is a perfect square or not? The way that we went about proofs last time, we did it in a, it's not an efficient out method. So, so far, to check if a bar is a quadratic residue we are left with computing the set where we look at one bar and this we used this in the proofs last time we can go at 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared. And we saw that we don't have to go all the way to p minus 1, but instead p minus 1 over 2, bar, and square that. And this set here will contain all the quadratic residues of the integers modulo p. But if p is small, like 5 or 7, this is fine. But what if we're talking with, a say, a 5-digit prime, or even larger? We, de we definitely do not want to compute this. And so what Euler discovered is that we can determine that a bar is a quadratic residue. If and only if, if we took a bar to the p minus 1 over 2, that this here is equal to 1 bar. And so if we go ahead, take a bar to the p minus 1 over 2, we're going to get back 1 bar. And so this is known as Euler's criterion, which he proved in 1748. So we're going to start off today with proving this result of Euler and laying the foundation so that in our next lesson, we can prove the Fermat two sums of squares theorem. So here's Euler's criterion, and what it says is if we have an odd prime p, and a bar is a non-zero element of the integers modulo p, then raising a bar to the p minus one over two, then we get that it's equal to one bar if a bar is a quadratic residue mod p, and if it's not a, quadra a quadratic uh, residue, so quadratic non-residue mod p, then a to the p minus one over two is just going to be negative one bar. And so the proof of this is going to utilize Lagrange's theorem once more. And so let's go through this. So here's the proof. So let's go ahead and suppose first that a bar is a quadratic residue. 
So then, there exists some p bar in the integers modulo p such that b bar squared is equal to a bar. Now, let's go ahead and raise everything to the p minus 1 over 2. So raising everything to the p minus 1 over 2, we're going to have squared, and then we're going to have p minus 1 over 2 equals a bar to the p minus 1 over 2. But now, this is the same, so I'm just going to rearrange it. I'm going to break the a bar to the left hand side here. So this is the same as the part over here. The 2's are going to cancel when we multiply, and so we have b bar to the p minus 1. But we're working over the integers modulo p, so every element, so b, b bar is of course non-zero, since a bar is non-zero, but b bar is a multiplicative, has a multiplicative inverse. So this is what we, we're call, we call a reduced residue. So since every non-zero element of the integers modulo p is a reduced residue, and so Fermat's little theorem applies. And so by Fermat's little theorem, this is going to be equal to 1 bar. And so we got this here. And so that establishes the first part, that if we have a quadratic residue, then a bar to the p minus 1 over 2 is exactly equal to 1 bar. So that was not so bad. But what about the case when it's a quadratic non-residue? And so let's go ahead and do that now. So now let's suppose that a bar is a quadratic is a non uh, a quadratic non residue then by Fermat's little theorem once more we get that a bar to the p minus 1 is going to be equal to 1 bar so we got this here but now let's go ahead and make the following observation. So we have 1 bar is equal to a bar to the p minus 1, which is the same as a bar to the p minus 1 over 2 squared. Now this here is valid because we know that p is an odd prime. So p minus 1 is even, so we can divide it by 2, and so we are still raising a bar to a positive integer exponent, and so this here is batted. But now this here, of course, is a bar to the p minus 1 over 2 times a bar to the p minus 1 over 2. So we got this here. And what does this tell us? We have that this times itself gives us back 1 bar. So in other words, a bar to the p minus 1 over 2 is its own multiplicative inverse. And now we, uh, we apply lemma 838, which tells us that whenever we are working over the integers modulo p, if we have an element that is its own multiplicative inverse, then either it's x equals 1 or x is equal to negative 1 bar. And so by, by lemma 8.3.8, we have that a bar to the p minus 1 over 2 is <clears throat> either 1 bar or negative 1 bar. And so let's go ahead and deduce that it cannot be equal to 1 bar. So we claim that a bar to the p minus 1 over 2 is equal to negative 1 bar, and so that's what we want to show. This is equivalent to showing that a bar is not a root of f of x where we take x to the p minus 1 over 2 minus 1 bar. If a bar is a root of this polynomial, then of course we will have 
that this will be exactly equal to one bar. And so if it's not a root, then now we have that by lemma 8.3.8 that it's exactly negative one bar. And so here's the beautiful part about this. By Lagrange's theorem, we know that this has at most p minus one over two roots. So here's a couple of facts that we're now we're gonna use to get this. By Lagrange's theorem, f of x has at most p minus one over two roots. Now, by what we did at the beginning, we showed that if a bar is a quadratic residue mod p, then we have that a bar to the p minus one over two is going to be equal to one bar. And so we got that as part of this statement over here, that a bar to the p minus one over two is equal to one bar. So by the above, each quadratic residue mod p is a root of f of x. But we showed in our last lesson we showed that there are exactly p minus one over two um, quadratic residues mod p. So we have exactly um, p minus one over two quadratic residues mod p and therefore each quadratic residue the roots of f of x are precisely the quadratic residues mod p and since a bar is by assumption a quadratic non-residue we have that f of a bar is not equal to zero bar so in other words a bar to the p minus one over two does not equal one bar. And so by lemma 838, it must be exactly negative one bar, which completes the proof. And so now we are done with the proof of Euler's criteria. And the heart of the proof is the Grange's theorem. And that's this, the, the beautiful aspect of this. We have this statement that's just telling us a polynomial has at most uh, the degree of, um, if the polynomial has degree d, it has at most d roots. But the way that we are using this allows us to conclude facts like this. And so by, by lemma 838, we conclude that a bar to the p minus one over two is equal to negative one bar. And so we're done. And so that's uh, another, that, that the main aspect here, how Lagrange's theorem continue to uh, come up in our proofs. So our next result is called Euler's identity, and it really is a restatement of what we just proved in theorem 11.2.1, .1, Euler's criterion, in that we are just using the definition of the Legendre symbol alongside the theorem to conclude that if p is an odd prime and a is an integer, then a on p is going to be congruent to a to the p minus one over two mod p. So let's just do a quick proof of this. And so again, it's just gonna be reordering the definitions and the statements. So by definition, we have that a on p 
is going to satisfy these conditions right here. Now, if we reduce the Legendre symbol mod p, we're just going to have 1 mod p, negative 1 mod p, and 0. So that will give us. And so we get a on p. Once we reduce mod p, we're just going to have 1 mod p, negative 1 mod p, and 0 mod p by the definition of the Legendre symbol. But then, this will be the same as being congruent by theorem 11.2.1 to just a to the p minus 1 over 2 mod p. Because a to the p minus 1 over 2 will be congruent to 1 mod p if it's a quadratic residue, negative 1 if it's a quadratic non-residue, and if p divides a, then we're just going to have 0 mod p. And so we, it is implied by theorem 11 to 1. And the fact that if p divides a, then a to the p minus 1 over 2 is congruent to 0 mod p. And so we are done. Euler's, criteria, Euler's identity. And so this proof is really just combining the statement from Euler's criterion, but now giving us the niceness of the Legendre symbol to summarize that. So next, we're going to go ahead and discuss what is the quadratic residue of negative 1. And so in other words, what is the Legendre symbol of negative 1 on p? And so these results are oftentimes referred to as Gauss's first supplement precursor theorem. And they were his necessary lemmas and his buildup to proving the law of quadratic reciprocity. And while the arguments that we will be showing today may seem rather straightforward in that not much is really happening compared to some of the arguments we have done previously. They were the results that eluded Euler in his work on these topics. And by using this result right here, our proof of the Fermat sum of two squares theorem is going to be simplified tremendously as we will bypass through using this theorem right here of the quadratic residue of negative one, an aspect that took Euler several years to patch. And so here's the relationship to the Fermat sums of squares theorem. So suppose that x squared plus y squared is equal to p for p a prime. Then if we reduce mod p, we get x bar squared plus y bar squared is equal to 0 bar, which in turn tells us that we have x squared is equal to negative y bar squared. But for this equality to hold, we know that x bar squared is a quadratic residue, since it is a perfect square, but so is y bar squared. So because this here is a perfect square, by virtue of this, we have that the Legendre symbol of negative y squared on p is equal to 1. But the fact that y bar, y bar squared is a quadratic residue, since it's already a perfect square itself, this is going to just be equal to negative 1 on p. And in order for this here to be a perfect square, we need the Legendre symbol, of course, to be 1 for negative 1 on p. If we assume the statement of Gauss, we have that negative 1 to the p minus 1 over 2 is going to be congruent, it's going to be equal to 1 if p is congruent to 1 mod 4. And so this is just a restatement in the language of the Legendre symbol. And so this happens if and only if p is congruent to 1 mod 4. And so we have part of a partial result with this is that the Fermat sum of two squares theorem, where a prime is a sum of two squares if and only if that prime is congruent to 1 mod 4, now we have a necessary aspect. That if a prime is a sum of two squares, then it must be congruent to 1 mod 4. Um, and I should say an odd prime, because of course the prime, equal, the prime 2 is equal to 1 squared plus 1 squared. And so in all this discussion, I should say p and not prime.
And so that's the connection. So lemma one, uh, so the first lemma, so this lemma 11.2.4, that will be left as a homework. So this will be exercise 11.2.7. And so what we are going to do is assume the lemma and prove theorem 115.4, which is the restatement in the language of the Legendre symbol. And so let's go ahead and do this. So proof. And so by Euler's identity that we just showed, we have that negative 1 on p is congruent to negative 1 to the p minus 1 over 2 mod p. So we have this here. But now, if we apply lemma 11 2.4, we get that this here is going to be 1 or negative 1 mod p. And then if p is congruent to 1 mod 4, if p is congruent to 3 mod 4, so we have these congruences mod p, but then we can go ahead and just drop the congruences in this case since we just have 1 or negative 1 for the Legendre symbol. And so we can conclude our desired statement that this here is going to just simply be, since negative 1 to the p minus 1 over 2 is either 1 or negative 1, we can go ahead and just let this be equal to negative 1, over, to, negative one to the p minus 1 over 2. And then the lemma tells us that this is going to be 1 or negative 1 depending on the congruence of p. And so we are done. So the next thing we are going to do is do something that I glanced over on this step here. So when discussing this, I actually did an intermediary step, namely we saw that y squared is a quadratic residue, and so it all depended on the negative 1 being a quadratic residue. But this is part of the multiplicativity of the Legendre symbol. So we could, we, we could actually write, and this will be the next result, that this here is the same as saying negative 1 on p times y bar squared on p. And so because y bar squared is a, since y, is, y squared is a quadratic residue mod p, we can go ahead and just write that as negative 1 on p times 1. And so this is an important aspect for the Legendre symbol that we can do this multiplication. And its proof is going to follow from Euler's identity. So this is the next statement. So we're going to be proving theorem 1.15.5. The corollary we're going to talk about after the theorem, but this here is going to be part of the homework assignment. So this will be exercise 11.2.8. So let's prove the theorem. So book version 11.2.5. So how do we do this? So by Euler's identity, AB on P is congruent to AB to the p minus 1 over 2 mod p. But exponent rules, we can go ahead and break that as a to the p minus 1 over 2 mod p times, oops, times b to the p minus 1 over 2 mod p. But now, if we think about, if we look at this here, this is exactly the multiplication of the two Legendre symbols for a on p and b on p. And so applying Euler's identity once more, we get that this is the product of a on p times b on p. And so we are done with our um, statement for the theorem, and so this, that finishes it off for this. So we get this statement here. And so now the corollary 
tells us that if we have an odd prime p, a bar, b bar are elements of the interiors modulo p that are non-zero, then as a consequence of the multiplicativity of the Legendre symbol, and you'll make this precise in the, in the homework, but we can see if here that if a bar and b bar are quadratic residues, their corresponding Legendre symbols is going to be one, and so the product is gonna be one. And then similarly, if they're non-residues, we're gonna have negative one times negative one, is gonna equal to positive one, so we get a quadratic residue. And so I'll let you in, fill in the third one. And so this will be for homework. So now we're gonna circle back to the ancient Greek. So we have a result from Diophantus, which tells us that if we consider the product x squared plus y squared times z squared plus w squared, then we can write that in the following two ways. But the key takeaway here is the following corollary from this identity. So proving this is just a matter of expanding this and verifying that upon expanding that we actually do have equalities for each of these three expressions. And so as a corollary, we see the following. If m and n are sum of squares, two squares, then so is the product, m times n. And so that's what we have here. Here we have m would be this, n would be this. And so then their product is a sum of two squares. And so we have this here. So we're gonna start with our series of lemmas to prove the Fermat sum of two squares theorem. So we'll first start off with this definition. We're gonna say that a natural number n is a sum of rel relatively prime squares if there exists non-zero integers x and y such that n is equal to x squared plus y squared. And so our first lemma tells us that if n is a sum of relatively prime squares and q is a factor of n which is also a sum of relatively prime squares, then the ratio n over q is also a sum of relatively prime squares. So let's go ahead and prove this. So by assumption, we know that n and q are sums of relatively prime squares, so that means that n is equal to a squared plus b squared, and q is equal to x squared plus y squared for non-zero integers a, b, x, y. We also have that the GCD of a and b is equal to one, and the GCD of x and y is equal to one. So that is using the definition. So next observe that if we take um, x squared n minus a squared q. This is going to be, upon substituting in for n squared and q, sorry, for n and q, we're gonna have x squared, a squared plus b squared, minus a squared times q, which is x squared plus y squared. But now, X times a squared, x squared times a squared is going to cancel off with this x squared times a squared over here. So that's going to result in having x squared, b squared, minus a squared, y squared. But that is a difference of squares, so we have xb plus a y, and then we have xb minus a y. So we have this here. We also know by assumption that q divides n, and so the linear combination lemma comes in. Since q divides n, and q of course divides itself, linear combination lemma tells us that q divides this difference, this uh, difference of squares. So Q divides the product of XB plus AY, XB minus AY. But Q is a prime number. So Euclid's lemma now comes in. 
So we have q divide xb plus ay, or q divides xb minus ay. Now, here we go ahead and do the following. We can uh, assume, but without loss of generality, that q divides xb minus ay. And so the reason that this is justified is that we know a is a integer, non-zero integer, so we can always change the sign of a to be positive or negative, since our a was chosen from this square, and so that would not change the sign. But what it would do is just change it so that now we're looking at xb plus ay. And so we're going to go ahead, so we follow the generality. We may assume that q divides xb minus ay. And I'll just make the note that I mentioned verbally. Um, since a is a non-zero integer, sine of a by its assumption Because all we have is that a was the sign so that n is equal to a squared plus b squared. So we could have just easily just switched a with negative a squared. And that would have still given us a squared plus b squared. And so that would be fine. So we're going to go ahead, take this as our assumption. So now if q divides this, that means that there is some integer d. So that d times q is equal to this difference. So there exists some integer d such that q times d is equal to xb minus ay. So we have now this here. And if we rearrange things, we get that ay is equal to xb minus qd. So we got this here. So now comes the tricky part of the proof. And so let me just convey some of the intuition of where we are headed. So what we are going to do is find a decomposition for a and b in our expression for n, so that we can write this a squared plus b squared in the way of the identity in Diophantus. And so specifically, we want to be able to write a as a sum and b as a sum. And so here is the clever argument to achieve this. So we're going to observe the following. So we're going to take a plus dy times y. If we expand this, we get ay plus dy squared. But we just have from here that ay is xb minus qd. So let's go ahead and substitute that in. We have xb minus qd plus dy squared. So we got this expression here. But we also know that q is equal to x squared plus y squared. So let's go ahead and substitute that in. So we have xb minus x squared plus y squared d plus dy squared. But now this results in a negative y squared d, which cancels off this dy squared. And so we have that this here is xb minus x squared d. So we have this here. So consequently, x divides a plus dy times y, since x is a factor of the right-hand side over here. So x is a factor, so x divides this. But we know that x is relatively prime to y, 
by construction. So that's how we we define Q as a, is a sum of relatively prime squares, x and y. So since GCD of x and y is equal to 1, uh, the general version of Euclid's lemma implies that x divides a plus dy. So we have this here. So now that tells us that there is a fact, some integer c. Let's go ahead and so that tells us that now x times c is equal to a plus dy. So there exists some integer c such that cx is equal to a plus dy, which in turn tells us that a is equal to cx minus dy. And so this is where this is building up. We now have a way of writing a as this difference. And keep in mind that our goal is to write this sum of two squares so that we can get this product here. And so that's where we are headed. So let us continue. Let's come back to the same equation we were just looking at. So we have a plus dy times y is equal to xb minus x squared d. So let's go ahead and consider that once more. So we have a plus dy is equal to x. Let's factor now this time around the x. And so we have b minus xd upon factoring out that x. But now we have shown that a plus dy is cx. Oh, and I forgot the y. So it's a dy times y on the outside. And so we have that this here is the same as cxy. So we've gone ahead, a plus dy. We know that that's c times x. So now we have c times xy. And we have that this here is equal to x b minus xd. But we can go ahead, divide both sides by x. x is non-zero, so we are, we, we are allowed to do this. And so we have cy is equal to b minus xd. But now this is equivalent to b is equal to cy plus xd. And so now we have a and b satisfy these forms. So let's go ahead and continue. So let us recap what we have. So we started off with n is equal to a squared plus b squared. And the a and b are, of course, are relatively prime. q is equal to x squared plus y squared. The argument we just did tells us that we can write a as cx minus dy. And we can write b as cy plus xd. So now let us use the identity of Diophantus. So let's come back to this here. And so what we end up getting upon applying this is that we have that n So we have n is equal to a squared plus b squared, which is equal to, let's go ahead and plug in. So we have cx minus dy quantity squared for a plus b, which is cy plus xd quantity squared. So we got this here. So now we apply the lemma 116.1. And so this tells us that we are going to have, um, so we're going to have here, so we have cx minus dy. So that's going to correspond to this here. So we're going to have c. And so specifically c squared. And we're going to have a z squared over here. Oops, not z squared, but in our case, a x squared. So we're going to have c squared and then x squared. And then we continue, we do this one more. We're going to have d squared 
and we're going to have y squared. So we're applying this formula over here to get this portion on the left. But now we have c squared plus d squared times x squared plus y squared. But we know that x squared plus y squared is q. And so we get what we wanted. Because now we have c squared d squared times q. But we know that q, of course, this divides n, as we see it here. And so now we have that n over q is equal to c squared plus d squared. And so we have this here. But are we done? We have shown that it's a sum of squares, but we now need to show that these are also relatively prime. So it remains to show that the GCD of C and D is 1. So let's go ahead and take the GCD to be U. So U is the GCD of C and D. Now we know that A is equal to CX minus DY, and so U has to divide A. And similarly, U has to divide B. So I'm going to go ahead and put this here. So the factorizations we have here, what we end up getting is U divides A and U divides B. So in particular, U divides the GCD of A and B, which is 1, which implies that U is equal to 1. And so now we have that N over D, N over Q, is a sum of red 3 prime squares. done with this with the lemma. Good. So to finish off today's lesson, we're going to do one more lemma in the path towards Fermat sum of squares theorem. So we're going to build on what we just proved, that if we have a sum of squares, a sum of relatively prime squares, and Q is, is a prime that is also a sum of relatively prime squares, then over Q is a sum of relatively prime squares. And so now what we want to prove is the following. If we start with N a natural number that is a sum of relatively prime squares, and K is a factor of N which is not a sum of relatively prime squares, then N over K has a prime factor which is not a sum of relatively prime squares. So let's go ahead and prove this. So proof. Um, so since k divides n, there exists some integer l such that n is equal to k times l. So we have this here. So towards a contradiction, Assume that L that each prime factor of L, which is N over K, is a sum of relatively prime squares. So that's going to be our contradictory assumptions. We have this. And the next thing we are going to do is take the factors, a prime factorization for L. So let's go ahead and take L 
to be the product from j equals 1 to, say, t of p sub j's, where each p sub j is prime. But now, these p sub j's don't have to be distinct, of course. Now, our contradiction assumption tells us that each pj is a sum of relatively prime squares. So our assumption, let me just try to be precise, our contradiction assumption implies that each pj is a sum of relatively prime squares. But now we have the following. So we have, so we have, um, so now observe. that we started off with n is equal to k times l, which is now equal to the product of all these primes from 1 to t, p sub j. But each p sub j is a sum of relatively prime squares. So now we are back in the setting of the previous lemma. And so what we are going to do now is continuously divide each statement, each of these. And so I'm going to do this non-rigorously. Um, and I'll just mention that the, there is a precise argument in the lecture notes for how to make this precise in the footnotes. But I'm going to sketch the intuition for what we're about to do. Um, and I'll leave you to fill in the details. So next, so by lemma, one point sixteen point two, we have that n over p1 is going to be a sum of relatively prime squares and applying lemma 1.16.2 in this fashion gives that n over then p1 over p2 is also a sum of relatively prime squares, n over p1, p2, p3 will also be a sum of relatively prime squares. And we just continue in this fashion until we exhaust all the primes of, of, uh, of L. And so we're going to have L in the denominator, and so we have n over L that each of these are each sums of relatively prime squares. But this is a contradiction. Since our assumption on k is that it was not. since k, which is equal to n over l, is not a sum of relatively prime squares by assumption. And so we are done with our proof. We, are, we now have um, the lemma that will lead to the next step, which is the descent lemma avoider and the reciprocity lemma avoider. And those together will imply the Fermat sum of two squares theorem. And so we are two results away from proving this. And so that'll be the context, the content of our next lesson.